Welcome, everybody. This is BizHack Live, our weekly webinar series on marketing during a pandemic and beyond. Uh, my name is Dan Gretsch, and we hold this uh, webinar every Wednesday at 1230 Eastern Time. We have a fabulous lineup of folks coming up. I'll be sharing with, uh, with you momentarily. Um, I wanted to first introduce myself. My name is Dan Gretsch. I'm the founder of BizHack Academy. Uh, I was a journalist for 15 years with NPR, PBS, Washington Post, part of a Pulitzer Prize while at the Miami Herald. And then I was a news director at WLRN Miami, the NPR station. Uh, after that, I transitioned into digital marketing where I worked for both a billion dollar company as well as two software startups. I uh, was the head of growth marketing for Offercraft, uh, pre-revenue, and we helped, I helped bring them to an exit. After we exited, uh, I asked myself, what do I want to do next? And I realized that I wanted to help people make the transition into digital marketing and to use it to help grow their businesses and their careers. And so that's where I started BizHack uh, Academy, which is an award-winning um, digital marketing training academy, particularly focused on helping business owners. Uh, I went to Princeton and FIU, and I'm a Fulbright Scholar. I wanted to talk to you about this amazing lineup of folks we have coming up on this Wednesday webinar series. Uh, obviously today we're gonna to be talking about customer retention, one of the keys right now to surviving and thriving during the uh, COVID-19 is the ability to get your core customers, the folks who've done business with you in the past, to come back. And Richard is a uh, world-renowned expert uh, on that topic. In two weeks, we're going to be talking about Google My Business. Google My Business is particularly important for any local business, retail, restaurant, uh, anyone that does geographic-based um, marketing, um, yoga studios, fitness studios. Um, if you're constrained by a geography, Google My Business is critical to your success. And Google My Business has been dramatically expanded in terms of its capabilities during COVID-19 and has become an essential part of being findable online, also known as search engine optimization. The week after that, we have the head of small business at TikTok. Um, this is gonna be an extraordinary event. We have more than 200 people already signed up for it. Um, the timing is gonna be interesting because a week after this event uh, is the deadline uh, for their sale, uh, according to the Trump administration, before TikTok, TikTok might be banned. Uh, in the US, uh, a lot of uncertainty around TikTok uh, and a chance for you to ask your questions directly to the head of small business at TikTok. TikTok has also recently introduced the self-service advertising platform, the kind that Google, Facebook, Amazon have. Um, and this is gonna be uh, an important part of their growth strategy as long as they're allowed to continue to do business in the US. Uh, the week after that, uh, we have the amazing Dave Bricker. He's gonna be talking about business storytelling. Uh, I don't think there's ever been a moment when being able to tell your business story has been more critical. Uh, and after that, we're gonna be talking about something we call method marketing, which is putting yourself in the shoes of your customers when you're marketing. So we have an amazing lineup. If this sounds like it's appealing to you and you'd like to be a part of all of them, we would welcome you to get a season pass for the season pass, you'll get registrations and reminders for all of our upcoming webinars, including through the end of December, as well as a email follow up from each of those with a recording of the webinar if you're not able to make it in person. The season pass also supports this webinar series. Um, obviously, BizHack puts a lot into it. We offer these by and large uh, free and open to the community and the season pass helps guarantee that we'll be able to do that through 2021 and beyond. Uh, now for our uh, special guest today, Richard Shapiro. Richard is the founder and president of the Center for Client Retention, TCFCR. Uh, he is a leading authority in customer experience, brand loyalty, and customer retention. And specifically today, he's going to talk about five tips for how to uh, really the secrets to customer loyalty and what drives repeat business based on his research with literally millions of customers over the years. He's the author of two books, one called The Welcomer Edge and the second called The Endangered Customer. Uh, welcome, uh, Richard Shapiro uh, to BizHack Live. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much, Dan. Uh, let me just share my screen.
Can everybody see that? Yes, we can. Looks great. So uh, once again, Dan, thank you so much uh, for that introduction. And uh, you've become a good friend of mine uh, since we started with Bruce's class, as well as the other classmates for the mastermind group. So I'm really lucky to have gotten to know you. So I, I first want to thank the entire BizHack team uh, for inviting me to this live video conference, you know, series. I'm very honored to be uh, part of the, uh, the group of presenters. I'd also like to thank uh, so many of the people that I know are on the call today from the mastermind class, from the strategic forum, from the global luxury group and uh, customer experience meetup, both in Florida and New York. And there are quite a few other people on this call or presentation that I do know. But for those of you who I don't know, you know, I'd love for you to learn about my journey uh, through this presentation and certainly through LinkedIn, I'd love to get to know you as well. So I want to take you back in time, a time when I was about nine years old. And every Saturday, my friends would be playing stickball, soccer, or touch football. But where was uh, little Richie Shapiro? Well, little Richie Shapiro, every Saturday, went to work with his dad. Every Saturday, he got up early, got dressed in a suit, drove to work with his father, and spent the entire day there until his father closed the door and locked the door at the end of the day. My job was being the cashier, and it really was a fun job. But more than a fun job, it was an education. And it was really my first taste of learning about customer service, customer experience, and customer retention. And this is actually a picture of my father and me about the same uh, age as I worked in my father's store. So of course, I'm on the left there uh, with the basketball and my father is in the right. He was always very well dressed, even playing basketball with those high socks. So I learned so many things from my dad, but three things that I'd like to, uh, uh, oops, sorry, three things that I, I Three things that I'd like to share with you are that number one, my father taught me that customers are people first, customers second. The second thing my father taught me is that to welcome everybody into the store, just like he'd welcome them into your home. You know, to my dad, the, the store was just another extension of our home, another place to make people feel welcome. My father also taught me the importance of and how to create an emotional bond with each customer from day one. And I feel very fortunate that even though my dad passed away when I was only 27 years old, that I am carrying out his legacy. And how am I carrying out his legacy? I'm carrying out his legacy in that I founded the Center for Client Retention over 25 years ago. And we do teach our clients how to create that emotional bond through our research, training, and consulting services. As Dan mentioned, I'm also an author of two books. He already mentioned the books. I'm also an adjunct professor at the Fashion Institute of Technology in New York. And therefore, I am sharing my knowledge you know, with my students. And in many cases, I am continuing to mentor my students even after the semester is over. I also created two customer experience meetup groups, one in Florida and one in New York. And lastly, I do things like sharing my expertise with doing this presentation and just trying to help, you know, as many people as possible. So the program today uh, is, you know, headlined five tips to get your customers back. So it's all about customer retention. And I think, uh, you know, I probably have way over 40 years worth of, of experience and whatever I shared to you with you today, I know that it works. Uh, because I've been involved with this, you know, business, you know, for a long, long time. So if we look at um, acquisition, because I'm not an acquisition person or a specialist, but I certainly know that these days it's a lot harder to bring in a new customer. You know, customers are less loyal and they also have more options. And there's so many vehicles for getting, you know, new customers in the door that a lot of those uh, vehicles cost quite a bit of money. So you're spending all this money getting in new customers, customer acquisition, but in many cases, that money is going down the drain if you don't have a proactive strategy in place 
to actually retain your customers. You know, and prior to the pandemic, you know, Google searches for commercial businesses and also just for e-commerce, they were already on the increase. But however, during the pandemic, and as we're doing, uh, even coming out of the pandemic, the process has accelerated tenfold. So now it is so important that your site is basically your home. And does your site welcome you know, customers or prospects the way my dad welcomed customers into his store? Unfortunately, mostly not. So I'm gonna be sharing with you five tips. And the beauty of these tips is that you are not gonna to have to go uh, home, or if you're in your home, you're not gonna to have to get it out of your drawer, checkbook, or you're not gonna to have to go to the bank and get a loan, or you're not gonna to have to bring in another investor in your business, because all of these tips are virtually take no money to implement. I consider them all to be low hanging fruit. So the five tips are connect before connecting, listen for magic phrases, use words to create relationships, invite the customer to return, don't ever say no, and conduct customer interviews. Now Richard, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but that's six. I know, that's what I was gonna just say. Well, <laughs> a I, bonus. Was gonna, I was gonna say, yes, Dan told me that marketers love bonuses. So therefore, <laughs> Uh, I, it's five tips plus one bonus, and actually, I am pretty good at math, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I know. This was like our little, you know, it's, they call this offer stacking when you're like, and there's even more. You know, you see it on QVC all the time. Back to you, Richard. <laughs> thank you, Dan, for that interruption. I appreciate it. That was a good interruption. So anyway, tip number one is connect before connecting. And this is both a strategy and a concept. And this is so, so important. You know, today, most websites basically have a sign on them. They don't really have a sign, but they do have a sign that says, please don't come in unless you're ready to buy. 95% of all websites have a sign on them that says, please don't come in unless you're ready to buy. It doesn't matter whether it's B2B or B2C. Now, I can't imagine my father when he had his store, ever putting a sign on, don't come in unless you're ready to buy uh, in front of his store, but that's what it, the way it is today. So the important thing to do, and 95% I think of websites don't do this, is really to engage the customer or prospect before you try selling them. You must engage before you sell. And uh, I think a couple examples that I'm gonna show you uh, are related to different industries, but I think if you can replicate the concept of two of the industries that I'm gonna show you, I think that would be very helpful. So unfortunately, my wife passed away in 2006, but a couple of years later, I started dating, and a few years later, I was very, very fortunate to find my current wife on Match.com. And if you can think of your site as or the same way that a, a dating site would work, like a traditional site like Match.com, I th think you can be much more successful in trying to gauge your customers before you sell them. So when you go on Match.com, you know the concept is, you know, after you enter enter some data, you know, you find, you know, they give you some options of people that match your uh, criteria. Maybe there's seven, in my case, women that might have popped up you know, each day or whatever it was, I don't remember anymore. But anyway, so you click on the picture of the person that, you know, you think uh, you might be able to have a connection with just by their smile or how they look or, you know, just whether you have any chemistry with that picture perhaps. And then you click on their background and it tells you what hobbies they have and what they like to do. And that's the way you establish a connection. That's the, really the way, you know, your website should work. Psychology today is another really good example. When I moved to New, to New York from New Jersey in 2007, I was looking for a new psychologist. And basically it's the same concept of a match.com. I put in my zip code and I put the type of psychologist that I was looking for and also maybe what the insurance uh, acceptance was. And then all of a sudden I got five or six pictures or maybe 10. Uh, we live in New York City, so there was a big sampling 
of psychologists. So how do you pick out a psychologist? You know, probably the same way that you'd pick out, you know, somebody that you might want to go on a date with, because you're going to be spending a lot of time with your psychologist and you're going to be sharing a lot of information. So you look at the picture, maybe you decide if you, if you want to work with a man or a woman or someone close to your age, and then you click on their picture and then you see where they went to school and what they say about how they deal you know, with clients. I think this is the way you really should try to develop your website so that once again, your website is like your home. So three websites that I like to show you that I do think are from major corporations. Also one happens to be a nonprofit to me and uh, Dan, if he gets any questions or, or pushback, I'd be welcome to hear those. But to me, these websites are totally devoid of human interaction. And ironically, the, uh, well, actually, before I tell you that, <laughs> I just want to tell you that uh, the strongest bond, which is another important concept, is between two people. The strongest bond is between two people. So just like the match.com and the psychology today, where it's going to be, let's say, between a psychologist and me as a person, every website and every company should be designed to try to create a relationship between two people. Because most likely, even if you're a B2B type account or business, you have a relationship with a specific customer or a specific supplier. And that's the whole concept. So not only- I wanted, to, I wanted to just pause you for a second because there's a lot of talk about B2B versus B2C. And um, I think there's a great point that Vern Harnish makes in the book Scaling Up that all marketing is person to person. And in fact, in many ways, the relationship is even more important in the B2B setting. And so the stuff that you're talking about um, transcends all marketing, no matter what kind of business or product or service you offer. No, absolutely, Dan. And I think what I always say, especially during this pandemic, but it happens all the time, that you, know, you could have a client for years and every time you have a new client, or no, I'm sorry, a new contact at a client site, you basically have a new, a new client that you have to start onboarding again. So, you know, there's, I would say the only companies that probably are an exception to this rule are maybe like Apple or Google, uh, you know, or Amazon, but pretty much every other company really needs to think about how they can establish a bond between two specific people. So now getting to the three websites that I was oh, talking about, actually, let me just, let me do this first. So the first uh, website is the American Heart Association. And the American Heart Association, ironically, if I'm talking about human interaction, what could be closer to human interaction than a heart? But when you look at uh, the American Heart Association, what you see here is right away, they're not trying to engage you. The only thing they want you to do is donate you know, money. So that's not telling me anything about the organization, what they do with their research, how they do uh, handle their funds. Uh, there's nothing in this to engage me. Right away, basically, they have that same sign, you know, don't do business with us, don't contact us unless you're ready to donate. The second website happens to be ADT, another big company. By the way, I, I just did these randomly. I didn't have to look too hard, but there's nothing, once again, that engages the company. It's, I mean, the person. It says, making moves to a new home, save now. You know, number one in smart home. I don't, I don't know. I don't, I, let's just say my house was robbed or, or perhaps, uh, you know, there's been a lot of robberies on my neighborhood and I want to find out more about their services. Actually, at one time, ADT was the only game in town. Now there's five different types of home services that you can get through Amazon and all kinds of other businesses. So there's, there's, once again, there's nothing on this site that really offers me the opportunity to engage. The last one happens to be a retailer, a pretty big retailer, Macy's. And Macy's you know, wasn't doing so well before the pandemic, but as any retailer or any business uh, has experienced lately, every business who used to do physical store business is trying to increase their market share uh, on their online site or on the e-commerce site. But on this Macy site, there's not even a telephone number for anybody to call. The only thing that you see right away is just an offer for, for one pickle item, perfect pick-me-ups, extra 20% you know, on some clearance items. Once again, no engagement, no opportunity to really say, hey, we, we'd love to help you. you know, we have a personal stylist or someone like that that can help you with your needs, you know, please contact us at this number or email us at this number and we'll be glad to help you. So an example of that, and I'm gonna go back, 
is I love the retailer uh, Mitchell's family of stores. Jack Mitchell, who wrote the book, both Hug Your Customers and Hug Your People, uh, he's the second generation of the Mitchell family of stores. And it's a luxury retailer. And when you go on their site, uh, let's say you're a prospect and let's say you're reading Jack's book and you live in Texas and you say, you know what? I heard that Mitchell's family of stores, which is primarily in, in, in Connecticut is a, is a great, uh, uh, a great, has great merchandise. So you go on their site and there, same thing was like psychology today or match.com. You have the opportunity to pick out the style advisor that you want to deal with. So, and by the way, this happens to be just five, but they have, you know, you can just scroll along. So there might be 30 or 40 different salespeople that you can communicate with and build a relationship with. And you can decide if you want to, you know, work with a man or a woman or maybe what age group. And then when you click on their picture, because you say, oh, I, you know, I think I'd like to, to uh, connect with that person. I'm sure she could help me with my needs. Then you have a pop-up and then, okay, so Andrew's, uh, information would appear. It tells you his favorite designer, his past style icon, which are uh, icons, which are Paul Newman, Marilyn Monroe, and Elizabeth Taylor. And then you find out, hey, you know what? He loves to go to St. Bart's. We're planning a trip to St. Bart's and let me contact this guy because not only can he help us, you know, with my apparel needs, I can maybe also find out more information about where we're going. And then you have the email address and telephone. Now, this is not high technology. Basically, this is just sending Andrew an email. And Andrew is a salesperson in the store, so he's not going to be accessible all the time, but he will call you back or email you back or text you back, whatever the communication is. That's how you create a one-to-one -one relationship. So I uh, teach one course, as I mentioned, at FIT, and I was so proud of one of my students, one of my students, Brianna, who's a, a designer, fashion designer. This is before the pandemic. Um, you know, at the end of the class or end of the semester, she said, Mr. Shapiro, you know, I'm working on my website. I would like to uh, uh, show it to you. Do you mind? And I said, well, of course not. I'd love to see it. So when I saw it, I was just so happy because Brianna definitely got it. And this is her, the homepage of her website. First of all, it's beautifully done. It's simple, very attractive. Her name is in the left-hand corner. But if you look in the right-hand corner, very simple, it says contact Brianna. Then at the bottom of every page, it says let's meet. Now, can you imagine Macy's doing that, by the way, right now? And then lastly, just to show you, this is Brianna. Now, you might be saying to me, okay, Richard, but I have a pretty big business. So you're telling me that, you know, one-to-one -one relationship is really important, but I, I have a lot of service people. I have a lot of sales people. You know, how can I possibly do that? So uh, I'm going to tell you how you're going to do it because I'm going to give you a great example. And the great example is T-Mobile when I heard uh, them speak about four years ago and every word that they said just makes sense. So when you go on the T-Mobile mobile site, there you're going to see this banner. Your dedicated team of highly trained experts is here to help you with the next level customer care. No bots, no bouncing, no BS, just real help from real people on your terms. So this is another alternative for any big business. Maybe you don't have to do one-on-one, -on -one, but you can have one customer possibly dealing with a team. And also what they explained to me at the time is that this team is just not a random team of people. If you sign up in New Jersey, then you're gonna be assigned a team of people who know something about New Jersey. Maybe they were born in New Jersey. Maybe they went to school in New Jersey. Uh, you know, maybe they visited New Jersey, but they know New Jersey and they know about the sports teams in New Jersey and they know about the traffic in New Jersey and they know about what companies might be in New Jersey. And there's a lot of pharmaceutical companies in New Jersey. So this way, the team actually automatically has a connection, an underlying connection to the customers. So these are the kinds of things that really make sense. So once I wanna, again- um, I wanna yes. just jump in and underline a couple of your points. We have a lot of small businesses on the, on the chat right now on the, uh, on the webinar. And what I wanna point out is uh, a lot of times when we're a small business, we wonder how do we differentiate ourselves? How do we 
uh, make ourselves uh, different than the well-heeled uh, national brands. And one of the ways is what Brianna did, which is sort of putting her story out front and making herself more accessible. And what I love about the T-Mobile example is you can take that exact same concept, this brilliant idea of the human to human element of marketing, and you can scale it all the way to the point where T-Mobile purchased Sprint and is now the third largest mobile carrier in the world, yet has somehow still been able to hold on to the human to human element. I can tell you as a, as a, a Verizon customer that the feeling of being a T-Mobile customer is profoundly different than being an AT&T or a Verizon customer. And if you feel me, nod your heads. I see some of you, uh, Joe Rose seems to be agreeing with me. The, the idea here is that these strategies that Richard is talking about are obviously easiest to implement when you're small, but they can be scaled. Um, and I love this idea of no bots, no bouncing, no BS. People really are hungry, especially during COVID, for human to human interaction. And it becomes a differentiating point if you make yourself and your team accessible. Thanks, Richard. Thank you, Dan. That was excellent. I appreciate that. So, so the next tip, uh, I'm sorry. Oh, it is. Uh, listen for, for magic phrases. I just wanted to make sure I didn't miss anything because the uh, it skipped. So listen for magic phrases. Um, let's see. Um, you know, there's a toolbox that everybody has, you know, either in their closet or their garage. And I'm going to tell you or show you the most valuable tool that you have in your toolbox. And what do you think that tool is? The most valuable tool is the telephone. The telephone is the most valuable tool that any business has, whether it's a cell phone or whether it's a physical phone in your law firm, accounting firm, insurance firm, it doesn't matter. And you have to really use this phone or you should use the phone to really create a, a personal connection. I'm gonna tell you right now that if somebody actually contacts your company by phone, that is worth gold because there's so much information on the internet that if someone actually picks up the phone and calls your company, that's a hot lead, okay? So I'm gonna tell you that I have a friend who has a company uh, for over 30 years and uh, I asked him, you know, just on the nuance of, of, of contacting their company, I said, you know, if somebody's interested in your services, what do they do? And they said, well, they press, you know, they call this 800 number and they press one for sales, two for service. So I looked at him and I said, Dave, uh, is there any reason why you can't have a direct number to sales? Why do you need to have somebody press one or two? And he looked at me and he said, Rich, I've been in 30 years in business. I never, ever thought about that. So the phone is absolutely the most valuable tool that you have in your business. And I, one of the tips later on is, is using the right language when you get somebody on the phone. And I think if you couple, if you understand the concept of the phone being so important and couple some of the scripting that I'm gonna share with you, I think it's gonna be a great match. So another thing that's really important that was mentioned in the abstract is active listening. And of course, it's always important to listen to what the customer has to say. But in addition, it's also important to listen to how they feel. And if you can understand or listen how they feel, it automatically provides a connection. So especially in so many businesses, if it's a customer and maybe something didn't go right, you know, they call the company or maybe even they write an email and they might sound really angry or, or disappointed or concerned. So if your people are trained on active listening and say, you know, I, I hear Jane that you're, you're disappointed with us, but I can help you with that. That's going to automatically make the customer feel much better about your company. And the beauty of active listening is if you tell a customer, uh, I hear you're disappointed with us and they're really angry. They're going to say, I'm not disappointed. I'm angry. And then all you have to do is really say, well, I hear you're angry, but I can help you. So active listening is so important. So these are kids and I have some grandkids who are about the same age. And there's a word that kids say 
that can get them almost anything. And of course, everybody knows that that word is please. So a please to me is kind of a magic word. But I also like to think in terms of magic phrases. And magic phrases are statements that people make that are opportunities to create a relationship. And some examples of those phrases are, I just moved to New York and I need a new will. So let's say somebody moved from New York to Florida and they're calling a law firm and they need a new will. My wife was recently diagnosed with X disease and I wanted to find out more about your charity. I heard about your company on a podcast, this hack, I was listening to the other day. A colleague suggested I contact your company. My wife is an interior designer and told me about your architectural firm. Well, let's just take the first one. You know, if somebody calls a law firm and they say, I just moved from New York to Florida and I need a new will, and the person says, oh, what's your name? What's your telephone number? I'll have someone call you back. That gets an F, okay? Because that was a magic phrase. They told you that they just moved from New York to Florida. You can say how wonderful we have so many clients that are moving from New York to Florida and we now have a big base and where did you move from and where are you living now and how do you like your new neighborhood? These are all phrases that can give you an opportunity to create a relationship and try not to lose those, lose those opportunities. Tip number three are use words to create relationships. And the beauty of this particular tip is that you can leave this Zoom call and set up a staff meeting this afternoon with your people. And if they employ these tips that I'm gonna give you, uh, tip number three, you can drastically improve your business in about 10 minutes. So what and are Richard, the- Just to clarify, uh, the magical phrase is when they share a little bit about themselves and their personal background, and then you can kind of create a personal relationship, just to clarify. Yes, yes. Perfect. All right. Yeah, that, that's a good clarification. You know, I, I often say, uh, you know, especially when you walk into a physical store, you know, if you walk into a physical store and you say, well, this is the first time I hear and I want to know if you have something, you know, that's an opportunity to find out, well, how'd you find out about this place? Or, you know, especially on the marketing side, there's so many magic phrases are a good opportunity to leverage the marketing to find out exactly how somebody did find about find out about you in the first place, you know, as Perfect. well. So, so, uh, this happens to be a letter, and I think everybody would know that it was an I. And I also happens to be one of the shortest words in the English language that has the greatest impact. And what people hate is that when you call a company for any reason, and the first thing they say is, well, what's your name? What's your telephone number? They don't like that, especially when they have a problem or an issue. So what I always advise companies to do is when anybody calls your company, I don't care if it's for a service, I don't care if it's for sales, what the person should say is, I can help you with that, but do you mind if I ask you a few questions? Everybody's gonna say fine, I'm, I'm sure you can ask me a few questions. One of our clients, a law firm said that this one training, piece of training advice uh, changed their entire business for the, for the positive because they just have an alliance now with another law firm that has a similar practice. And he said to me, this was Mark, Mark said to me, absolutely positively, before the training, Rich, if somebody had called and said, do you do this uh, service? We would have said, we would have started off with no, but you know, I can refer you to someone. Now they say, oh, I can help you with that, but do you just mind if I ask you a few questions? And they get those questions and they have the appropriate, he said it dramatically changed the way they're, they're uh, getting new business in. The next one is so, so important. And this is great for prospecting, it's great for customer service. Never ask, do you have any other questions? Always ask, what are the questions do you have? When you ask, do you have any other questions? You're basically telling the prospect, especially if it's a prospect, when talking about marketing here, that you have time for one more question, okay? You're doing them a favor. You have time to answer one more question. But when you say, what are the questions do you have? You're probably gonna get three more questions. And those three more questions are gonna help you land more business or better service the customer. The last one is, please come back versus I want to see you again. 
Now, please come back is a sign that you put on a deli door, a deli, back of a deli door after you've ordered and gotten your bagel and cream cheese. That's what you would say, or that it's not what you would say, that would be the sign in the back of the door. What you should be saying is, I want to see you again for whatever the reason is. When you say, I want to see you again because I heard you're going on a vacation or it's your daughter's wedding or you're moving to bail and I want to hear about it or you're going to your grandson's first birthday and I want to see the pictures. That's how you continue the relationship. Invite the customer to return. As Dan said, and I mentioned, I did write a book called The Endangered Customer, Eight Steps to Guarantee Repeat Business. Uh, step number six, which is the key to customer retention, is invite the customer to return. So this is a couple on a first date. I'm going to tell you that they're on a first date. So let's just say you are dating and you're looking for the love of your life, which is pretty important, you know, for anybody's life. And uh, let's say you did it on a dating app. So you went through the dating app, uh, you message the person, then finally you text them and you call them and you say, oh, this person really sounds good. I like their picture on the internet. And then you meet them. So you meet them and you say, oh my God, they're even better than the picture and there's a little chemistry there, and you have such a wonderful conversation. What do you hope happens before the evening is over? Everybody guess it's right. You hope that before the end of the evening, the other person says, we had a great time, let's do it again. If they don't say that, especially in a dating situation, and basically in, in business, you're on a date, okay? When they don't say that, you think that that person doesn't want to see you again. And actually in the dating world, it's probably true. If somebody doesn't say that, you're never, going to, you're never going to hear from them again. So then you're calling your parents and your friends and your siblings saying, you know, I really like Joe. I really like Mary. I thought they were going to be my life partner, but they didn't say they wanted to see me again. So if you don't tell a person that you want to see them again, they think that you don't. That's also tied into the whole concept of customer experience. You know, sometimes people will ask me, what's the difference between customer service and customer experience? Well, every time you have a transaction, whether it's a, for a prospect or for a customer, the customer experience, which is a series of dates all put together, so they form a romance, but every time someone calls your company or buys a product, the customer experience has been put on pause. In order for that finger to go from pause to play, you need to invite to return. You need to say, I want to see you again, or I want to hear from you again, based on the story that you found out. That's how you continue the relationship. So the invite to return is the major key to generating repeat business. Tip number five is never say no. And I always like to show a set of dominoes because anybody who's played dominoes or seen dominoes play, you know that dominoes, if you just jiggle the tile a little bit incorrectly, all the tiles are gonna fall. And it's the same thing with customer loyalty. When you say no to a customer, all those dominoes are gonna fall. I don't care if that customer has been with you a year. I don't care if it's a prospect who's now really interested in your services. Once you say no, all, all those tiles fall. Matter of fact, no, which is actually a two letter word, I always say is the same as a seven letter word. And you know what that seven letter word is? The seven letter word is goodbye. Hmm. When you tell a customer no, you're basically telling the customer goodbye, have a good life, maybe I'll see you at some point. That's what you're really communicating. Uh, my wife and I combined two uh, apartments in New York and of course we did expect some problems and we were looking for a good contractor and we have a lot of uh, units in our building actually 500 so someone recommended Michael and we did have issues but what we loved about Michael is Michael would always say Richard and Susie call us into a little meeting we have a problem but we have three solutions he never just told us we had a problem so this way one maybe one of the solutions was we're going to take more time maybe more money maybe some other alternative. But Michael always presented us with options, not just a problem. 
The last thing I want to say about this particular let is, me, um, let me yeah. just jump in real quick. We have a great question from Kate Boyer. Kate said, how does this advice apply to dot-com or e-commerce businesses if there's no chance for saying things in person or on the phone? So she's like, do you have a pop-up window or an automatic email response flow since everything now seems digital? Well, even in the e-commerce world, if you're answering an email, you should never say no in the email, number one. But number two, I always say in the e-commerce world, you should try to have the customer call you. You know, you should set up a phone conversation. To me, that's the best thing. If you can get a customer in the e-commerce world to speak to uh, a well-trained representative, then you're going to secure that customer for life. So I don't okay. care what, yes. And I think a really good example of that is Zappos. You know, Zappos is a company that is an e-commerce company. They sold shoes online, but their customer service was famous. And one of the things that they were famous for is that their customers, uh, their customer service team was trained that no matter what you called with, whatever issue you had, they would try to help you. And uh, it, was, it was that that distinguished them from just another online shoe re retailer. Um, so I do think, for instance, that a live chat with a human being on the other side um, can be very powerful as well. Um, you know, if you're not in a position to be able to have uh, a full customer service uh, line. But um, I think that what Richard is trying to say here is the more that you can mimic um, and recreate the human to human interaction, uh, the more warmth and the more loyalty uh, and the higher likelihood you will have of having lifelong customers. Thank you, Dan. And also, I just want to let you know that Kate, who is founder of a luxury women's wear company, she has amazing people. So Kate, you absolutely positively should encourage people through e-commerce to talk to your people and you'll definitely have them as customers for life. And we have um, Stephanie, I know you're, I'm interrupting you here, Richard, but we have Stephanie Miller. And Stephanie, would you mind unmuting yourself and asking your question? Stephanie actually happens to be um, kind of a customer experience expert and someone who uh, has really worked in this area a lot. And I would love for you to, uh, and works with companies in the area as well. Hey, Stephanie, welcome. Hey, thank you so much, Robert. It's such a pleasure to um, see your genius in, in, in action. So I'm, I'm thrilled thank to you, be Stephanie. here today. Um, I'm asking this question because I think it's um, it's something I know that I've experienced working in the past is also working with other types of companies where, um, you know, their, their customer service agents or their customer success uh, groups are being asked or tasked around things that just kind of fall out of the scope of their expertise or their solutions and there's a sense of like, we don't, we, we want to help this person solve this problem. We just don't necessarily know how. So what's some good advice or what's a great recommendation for when something comes at you that might be a curveball or out of your scope of service and what's the best way to respond in those moments? Sure, Stephanie, that's a great question. So getting back to a couple of slides ago, that's why I like the statement, I can help you with that, no matter what it is, but, but, uh, but do you mind if I ask you a few questions? And the, the helping with them could be that you have to check with your boss or, or like, I don't know if you're familiar with the Miracle on 34th Street you know, movie, which is played every Christmas, but maybe just like Chris Kringle, you had to refer gimbals you know, when you were working at Macy's. I love that. Yeah, I love that analogy. Yep. So that's what you have to do. It doesn't mean that you're going to give them exactly what they want, but if, which is tied into my next series of slides. But yes, if you just tell the customer you can help them, they're not frustrated and you are going to try to help them because this company that you're talking about is trying to do it. So sometimes if you just go up the ladder or down the ladder, someone else might have a similar problem where they know exactly where to get that solution. And that's what Zappos does, by the way, just like what Dan said. You know, you could order a pizza there and they do it. You know, I mean, they'll send you a pizza. They'll, they'll look up the pizza place that has the best pizza in your area. They'll do whatever it is. They don't care. That's why they're so successful. And I would add, you know, there's nothing more frustrating. <laughs> I lived in Argentina and uh, Argentines are very funny because I think they're good at this. They, they like to say yes and they like to be helpful. Uh, but I remember I had this experience where I would... Um, 
with total confidence and a hundred percent willingness to help. And they were often uh, completely wrong. Like they sent me in the wrong direction. So Richard, how do you, how can you be honest with your customer about what you don't know if you're trying to be helpful? Well, let me, let me, let me just, I think, let me just tie in my next slide and then I'm going to go back to that. Okay. Because it, it's slightly tied into, uh, to, to what your question is. I, I was, I, I addressed it. I addressed it. I, I spoke at the national retail federation a few years ago and in the audience was the premium scar association. And they immediately asked me to speak at their conference for a trade show in July, in the middle of the summer, which I did. And uh, of course, when I went there, I checked out the room the night before and there was 800 ashtrays in the room. Uh, so I knew that whatever money they paid me for the talk was partially gonna have to go for a new suit. Anyway, the next day I, I did my talk and uh, there, it was very well received and now 800 people were actually smoking cigars. And someone at the end said, well, what if you absolutely have to say no to a customer? And because uh, you know, he said, you know, we have a lot of crazy customers. I said, well, everybody has some crazy customers. I said, but I think it's important that you never say no on the spot. You know, you always say, let me check, let me get back to you. People do not like when you say no. I mean, it, it's a killer. So I just think that it, it is one of the important concepts and sometimes by the way, somebody, you know, you could be the owner of the business and maybe one of your people has figured out how to do something. So it's not just going up the ladder, it's just going down the ladder as well. I think you have to do it. If you really want to keep a customer for life, you have to, you know, try to do at least whatever you can can. Even if the answer is ultimately no, or I, I really don't know how you can, I can help you, people are going to appreciate that. Perfect. Um, do you want to follow up with your final slides? Yes, real, let me just, um, so the, this is an important section. Uh, it's conduct customer interviews. And, um, you know, I was at ADP for a number of years, uh, actually when the revenues were 40 million, when I left there 4 billion, I was account executive, client services management, general manager, and then a vice president of client retention. And I was uh, given the responsibility for uh, updating their account manager program. And what I found out is, and this is so important for B2B accounts, but it's all businesses, but also on your high-end consumers, if it's B2C, that how do you make sure that you not only keep your business clients, but you increase market share? So the key to that really is, and what I found out is we had people going out to see accounts, but they weren't seeing the decision maker they were only seeing the user, and there's a reason why a decision maker is called the decision maker. Also, even if they were seeing the decision maker, they were not asking the decision maker the right questions, or they didn't even know what questions to ask. And even if they were asking the right questions, no one was doing anything with it. So I know we're a little short of time, so I'm not gonna go through all the questions, but it will be in the handout that, that Dan is sending. But I have developed a whole series of questions, and these questions will absolutely positively help you increase market share with your customers. Customers will tell you anything. You just have to ask the right questions and you also have to ask them in the right order. You can actually find out what percentage of the business you're getting if you're only getting a partial business from, from one of your customers. So it's so important that, and, and uh, we'll share the questions in the handout, that you do this, uh, a series of customer interviews. Now I do want to just share this slide with you because this is so important. Never call this a survey. This is a customer interview. Survey unfortunately is a bad word even though we get most of our revenues coming from surveys. But always call it like a customer feedback process or strategic review. And tell clients this is just what you do. Matter of fact, a prospect could be very impressed if you say, you know what, once a year we do a strategic view, review with you and these are the types of questions that we ask and come up with 50 questions, and maybe you ask 10 or 15 at a time. But absolutely, positively, these questions, when we did it at ADP, when I developed it, the uh, customer retention went from 83 to 96%, and we tripled our incremental revenues just by doing this process. The last thing I do wanna say is that when I taught my class, and it was like 20 hours of instruction, I did ask my students, what's the most important thing that you remember out of the class? And they said, well, when you went to an antique store with your wife in North Carolina 
and there you saw this sign, enter as strangers, leave as friends. That's what business is all about. People are gonna come in as strangers and not everybody's gonna turn into a friend, but that's what you have to try to do. But they're never even gonna enter your website unless you make your website comfortable enough and treat it like your home. So I do wanna thank BizHack and, and Dan. I know we're gonna to continue to get questions, but I really appreciate this opportunity to share my knowledge. And I would love to uh, get some new friends along the way for those people that don't know me. Absolutely, thank you so much, Richard. We have a couple of really good questions that I've gotten in the chat. I just wanna make a comment. When I run these webinars, um, when I, from my days in broadcast, I really take seriously the idea of being a host. Uh, you'll notice those of you who came on early that Richard and I were greeting you personally. And uh, actually, Richard, you're one of the only guests I've ever had that did that. Um, and the reason why I think as the host is if I'm welcoming you into my home, whether it's a real home or a webinar home, uh, I should say hi when you walk in the door. Wouldn't it be weird to kind of ignore you or not even acknowledge your presence? And um, I think of these webinars as like a big salon or dinner party, and I'm the host of that. And I'm here making sure everybody's having a good time, trying to address your questions, and most of all, trying to make sure that Richard, our guest of honor, is gonna be at his uh, best. And so I think in a sense, this is another digital interaction um, that uh, talks to this idea that Richard's got at the core of this, which is you really wanna try to build a, a rapport and a relationship um, to try to, um, you know, create uh, the kind of lifelong relationship, customer relationship you're looking for. Richard, a couple questions related to that, specifically in the small business context. Number one, it's a lot of resources that you're talking about, these one-on-one -on -one interactions, whether it's your time as the founder or training up and hiring a sales team to do this uh, in this way. How do you address what is inevitably, whether you're a small or a large company, going to be the resource uh, complaint or the resource objection? Yeah, well, the slide that I passed over, but it's a perfect slide for, the, for, the, for your question. You know, most businesses, especially B2B, have the 80-20 rule. So if you have a business, you know, and you have 200 customers, probably 40 of those customers represent 80 of your interviews. So I would do these customer interviews with the 40, which represent 80 of your business, which is less than one a week. So if you can't do one a week, you know, that's an issue, but that's what I would do. I would take the, you know, your major customers and do this. And then if you have other people on your team that might be uh, proficient at this, or you could train, you know, maybe you have them do the next tier. That's what I would suggest. Yeah. Another suggestion I would throw out there is if you're using the chat function on your website, you can create a series of questions, they call this a bot, that take people, it's almost like a phone tree that take them down to their most common questions. A lot of people, especially younger folks, actually prefer to not have phone interactions, um, or at least they say they don't, but you can get them the, in an efficient way, the answers to the most common questions. And then that 20%, you can get 80% of things answered quickly that way, and then the 20%, really are best left to a human to human, a phone interaction. But at least, you know, the, the common exp things like, you know, what is your location? What are your hours? Even something as simple as, are you open? Um, we've seen a lot of small businesses that put in their Google, my business, yes, we are open, which would be like a ridiculous thing to put in almost any other circumstance, has actually dramatically increased the traffic to their website and the commerce that they're having at their retail store, just simply because people, before they want to make the trip, uh, want to know, are you open? Um, we had a really interesting question from David Fleischman, which is what happens when you're, you know, Boeing and your 737 MAX is a fundamentally flawed airplane um, and you, you don't have a clear solution as your customer service rep? What, what might be the advice you would give in a s difficult situation like that? Well, that's an excellent que question, David. Listen, I think when you have a major issue like that, you just have to try to keep in touch and keep close to your customers, you know, in between, you know, because you're not going to be able to change the technology or fix it in a minute. But, you know, the personal relationship is so important. So not only should you have a business relationship, which maybe you can't do so much about during this time, but then just keep in touch with them, make sure that they are right, you know, as, as people and, and just keep in touch with them and build a relationship and hopefully, uh, when uh, the issue is fixed, that they'll definitely want to come back, you know, and they won't be angry at you because they won't, 
you know, you're a person and you've been in touch with them. That's what I would suggest. Yeah. Um, I would also add that another thing that a lot of small businesses struggle with is what happens if we don't have a follow on offering? I mean, this is actually a case with BizHack. Um, BizHack um, often is asked after folks go through our five week accelerated program, what else do you have? And uh, right now, you know, we are as a business really focused on kind of optimizing and, and scaling the delivery of our five week program. And we haven't yet uh, built that follow on offering. And it's a struggle that I constantly have. I have a lot of folks, some of whom are probably even on this uh, webinar right now who want to do more business with us and I don't really have a great offer for them. How, how, and, and I think a lot of small businesses struggle with this um, and, and because it, it does take resources to create new offerings and then support them um, effectively. Well, uh, I, I think once again, by using the customer interview process to really find out what they're looking for, sometimes maybe you can have an alliance with another company. You know, even if you don't have the resources, you know, you might be able to have two or three other partners that, you know, can provide those additional services and still have you, you know, as part of the family. So uh, that's, that would be my only suggestion with that. Yeah, I mean, I think that part of what we're doing right now is customer interviews to find out when we're ready to offer that next product, what that next product would look like. Um, and really try to begin to figure out, it's sort of like you do a series of customer interviews when you're first bringing a product to market to make sure that there's a product market fit. I feel like that customer interview, that customer development process continues as you're in business to say, how else can we serve you? No, absolutely. Um, and any other questions from the audience before we uh, wrap up for the day? This has been uh, really amazing. Um, I wanted to just give a call, shout out to Johanna Schmidt, who talked about wine.com. Um, they engage a real person via messenger within minutes of being on their site, guiding customers through the process of finding the right fit based on their taste, curiosity, purpose, etc. I think there's a huge, it's almost like a shopping concierge. And I think there's a huge opportunity right now for providing a concierge like service to help guide people who are navigating on their own um, through the website and through the best product and fit for them. Um, Michelle was asking whether there's gonna be a handout of what was discussed. Yeah, Richard has created a handout and we're gonna also be sharing the slides from this discussion. Um, Richard, if it's okay, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen just as we um, uh, wrap up. Um, so I wanted to uh, quickly talk about, um, you know, BizHack offers a five week accelerated course in digital marketing, uh, specifically focused on small businesses, folks with limited resources and limited staffs. Uh, we also have a lot of marketing professionals in this. If you're interested in the course, go to apply.bizhack.com. Um, we also are offering a scholarship program for minorities and female-led businesses. That's at try.bizhack.com slash scholarship. Um, these are some of the key links, um, and uh, Lilia will put some of those into the chat so you guys can um, please, uh, you know, share this with folks in your networks. We'll also have this in the follow-up email we sent. And for those of you interested in learning more about the five-week program, we are going to have an info session this Friday at 11 Eastern time. As I mentioned, we have Google My Business, TikTok, Power of Business Storytelling, and uh, Method Marketing, putting your shoes, yourself into the shoes of your customers. All of these could be available if you're interested in a season pass. Each one is a unique link and it's by invite only. But if you did want to sign up for all of them, we definitely would encourage that you buy a season pass. And um, with that, I just wanted to say thank you so much, Richard, for this amazing insight. Honestly, this is um, one of the most important topics right now. Um, we have a, another minute or two, so I'll leave you with this question. How has your advice adapted changed or been updated by the limitations of human to human interaction that COVID has brought on, uh, where we're relying far more on digital and phone communication than ever before. How has this changed the equation of customer well, attention? In, in many cases, I, I'm gonna end with a positive. I, I think it's been, there's so much opportunity in this virtual world. We wouldn't be able to have this seminar here, you know, if it had to be in person, because we have people from New York and Colorado and. Florida and every probably other state. So I think the virtual society is going to, that's going to be a benefit that, you know, grows out of this. So there's no reason I've built up so many wonderful relationships with people that I didn't know before. 
uh, on Zoom, and there's no reason why you can't create wonderful relationships one-on-one -on -one in this virtual society. So, and I want to thank you, Dan, for your wonderful questions and the interaction, and certainly everybody who uh, you know attended today's program. Absolutely. One thing I'll say is, you know, BizHack was an in-person only training academy up until uh, March of this year. We pivoted to online and in our last cohort, some of whom are on this call today, we had seven international students from five countries. So I do feel like the ability now to connect human to human across borders is more powerful and easy uh, than ever before. The other thing I would say, though, is this, the hunger for human connection is also greater. We are, many of us, you know, sheltering at home, isolated, quarantined. And this human interaction, that getting on that phone call and just being human uh, in that relationship will create a level of loyalty that will stand you well. So what I would say, and this kind of goes back to a question earlier about, about resources, which is what do you do if you don't have enough staff to fully, uh, uh, you know, uh, occupy your sales team um, is I would definitely welcome, and this is from David Shiner, I would definitely encourage you to resource customer interactions sufficiently so that you can have human to human interactions. And one of the things I'll say about Amazon and Google in particular is these are companies that have prioritized and invested more than almost any companies in the history of the world that human um, delight and interaction. Now they do it algorithmically, right? So talking to someone at Google, talking to someone at Amazon isn't necessarily the easiest thing, but because they've created an online experience that puts the customer first, I think they've paved the way to become some of the largest companies in the history of the world. And so in many ways, I do think that Amazon and Google are examples of using algorithms and a very close study of listening to your customer through how they interact with you online to kind of build this. And so, and so in many ways, um, they're great examples and inspirations for all of us. How can we deliver a great customer experience, do so in a way that's both efficient and still feels intimate? Um, so with that, guys, we'll see you um, in two weeks uh, when we have our Google My Business with Yoel Gutierrez. And until then, uh, enjoy what's left of your summer and uh, stay safe. Thanks very much. Thank you. Really appreciate it, everybody. Jorge, it's nice to see you. Yeah, thank well. you for joining us. Joe Rose, Linda, David. Thank you, everybody. Bob, Brian, Cheryl, uh, Harry, David, Jack Killian, Jerome Brown. Thank you, guys. Really appreciate you making it out here today. Uh, it's been great to have you. Ruth Ann, uh, one of our first season pass holders, welcome. Sri Rajan, uh, thank you. Glad you could be here, Terry. Uh, thanks, everybody. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Dan, and thank you, Richard. Bye, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your summer, everyone. We'll see you in two weeks. Thank you, Richard. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you for joining.